Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hugo Schumann. As mentioned, I'm the commercial manager of Barclay Energia, and we are developing Europe's largest uranium mine. Um, as a big cricketer myself, I'm delighted to be at Old Trafford. It's, uh, I think, a long time since the South African ventured this far north into Old Trafford. Back in, I think I was looking on the train, it was September 2012 when South Africa last played England, and uh, characteristically, the game was rained out. So <laughs> nice to be here. Um, <coughs> Last year was, was a big year for the UK. It was the first time that renewable energy um, eclipsed coal in the production of uh, power in the UK for one quarter. Uh, but I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, renewable energy accounts for only 20% of the UK's installed capacity. Fossil fuels with coal, um, gas, and, and uh, oil still account for around 60%. And the balance of the UK's power comes from nuclear. Um, I think if we're heading towards a clean energy, carbon-free future, which some analysts predict will occur by around 2050, then it's not a, a matter of renewables or nuclear, but a matter of renewables and nuclear. Europe is by far the world's largest uh, producer of nuclear power. It has about 160 nuclear reactors in operation. Yet, bizarrely, there's just one uranium mine in the whole of Europe. Uh, it's located in the Czech Republic, and it produces less than 1% of Europe's uranium feed. As a result, Europe relies on countries like Kazakhstan, Niger, and Russia for the vast majority of its uranium inputs. This is at a time when energy security is a key problem for governments, and Putin is playing pipeline diplomacy. And unfortunately, this problem is only going to get worse, because China and India are developing a huge nuclear reactor fleet, which is going to be competing for uranium away from Europe. And this is really where our Salamanca uranium project comes into play. It's located in western Spain, and when it's developed, it'll be one of the top 10 mines globally, and by far the largest producer of uranium in, in Europe, producing around 4.5 million pounds of yellow cake per annum. To give you an idea of scale, that's enough to power the whole of the UK's energy needs for five and a half years. It's a big project. Thanks to these two, um, we have had a lot of success, and I think this is what separates Barclay from its peers, both in the uranium space, but also in Spain. We've had a lot of success with our permitting. We have a mining license, uh, we have an environmental permit, and the plant has been approved as a radioactive facility. As a result of this, we've got all the permits we need to start construction, initial construction, three months ahead of schedule, and we'll be doing that. We'll be hopefully announcing this month the award of contracts for that initial work. Uh, these two guys, Paco on the left and Javier on the right, were formerly the general manager of operations and the head of legal and finance for the very successful Spanish mining company, Rio Narcia. At Rio Narcia, the two of them permitted, constructed, and operated three very, very large uh, mines in Spain, and they've been charged with getting the Salamanca project up and running. We're in a region of Spain that's been very hard hit by intergenerational unemployment and rural desertification. Uh, we were very amazed by the fact that when we published vacancies for the first 200 jobs, we received 18,000 fully documented applications. That's by December of last year. Today, that number's risen to close to 20,000 applications. Now, to give you an idea of what's happening in these towns, the local school, the local primary school, has just five students in it. If it loses one more student, they close the school down. The local petrol station closed down a couple of months ago, and the residents now need to drive 20 kilometers to refuel their cars. Uh, the Salamanca project will be by far the biggest stimulus to this region in over a decade. We're going to be producing around 450 new jobs, and there'll be indirect jobs of around 2,000 on, on top of that. We're training locals. We're, we're preferentially hiring locals. And I think we're making a big impact on the community across the different age groups. For our shareholders, there are three value drivers, value uplifts that we identify um, from the Salamanca project. And the first one is the most obvious and, and probably the easiest to understand, which is just that we go and build the project. And by building the project, we get the cash flows and we get that NPV. Uh, the NPV of Salamanca is equivalent to £1.31 on our share price, uh, compared to our current share price of about 23 pence. 
The second driver of value for us is the belief that the uranium price has a lot of potential to rise from where it is now, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the third value driver is our belief that this project has the potential to become a lot bigger as a result of exploration success and drilling programs that we're currently uh, managing. Salamanca project has quite phenomenal project economics. Uh, it has a rare combination of low operating costs and very, very low upfront capital costs. Uh, pretty much any uh, mining executive who stands here will tell you that his project has first quartile operating costs. But the reality is that to get first quartile operating costs, you have to invest a lot of money to get scale. You have to build scale and you have to build infrastructure, and it's going to cost you hundreds of millions of dollars. Salamanca benefits from incredible infrastructure, largely funded by UK taxpayers um, from the EU. <laughs> um, we have, to get to the project, you fly to Madrid, you drive two and a half hours along a sealed highway, four-lane highway. You get to the deposit and you have a power line running over. You have local sources of water. The villages uh, have highly skilled labor forces. It's not like a project in Africa or Canada or the outback of Australia where you need to build a new camp. You need to build new power lines, railways, roads. Um, this is very, very low upfront capital. And the result is that we only need $81 million to get up and running. Not bad for a project that will be number eight in the world in terms of scale. And not bad for something that delivers that low cost of $15.60 per pound, which is half the current uranium price. The, the low operating cost, which is a key factor in this project, is, is largely because of this new discovery we made called Zona 7 on the left. Uh, Zona 7 is a remarkable piece of geology. It's a deposit of 30 million pounds of uranium that sits just four meters below the surface and is about the size of a car park. It's very, very high grade. In the pit, it's about 500 parts per million, making it one of the highest grade deposits globally. And that combination of grade and near surface means the mining costs are very, very low. We've also got the benefit of low processing costs because of very good metallurgy. And we have local sources of very cheap acid, which is the key component of the operating cost. When you couple those two with low cost power from the national grid and the fact that we're very close to the port of Santander and local transport infrastructure, you have a very, very, very competitive operating cost environment. We're in the process of financing the mine. Um, we're talking to bankers and to private equity funds and to users of the product. And most bankers will completely ignore the analyst consensus uranium price in looking at the project. And they'll take the spot price flat over the life of the mine, which is that top line, I mean that middle line. And then they'll whop it down by 30% and see if the project still makes money at that level. The great thing about Salamanca is even at that very, very risked scenario, the project still churns out $30 million of annual cash flows after tax and has an operating margin of more than 40%. Looking at the second leg of value for, for our shareholders is our belief that the uranium price is about to explode on the back of a big, big demand push from China and from India. These are both, as we all know, very, very big um, consumers of fossil fuels and very big polluters. And they've both committed to spending a lot of money to build new uranium, uh, new power plants from uranium. Uh, that's a spend of $227 billion, and they're each looking to open 14 new nuclear reactors per annum. This is real. China opened six reactors last year and is opening five reactors every year from now until 2020. When you consider that every new nuclear reactor requires about 2 million pounds of uranium, that's a demand shock of 30 million pounds per annum on a total market of around 150 million pounds. So we're going to see a big growth in, in uranium demand. But amazingly, there's hardly any new projects out there that are going to meet this demand. We've labeled here on the barrels the, the 10 best development plays globally. Only six of those work at current uranium prices, and those are shown in green, with the operating costs less than $30 per pound. But more so, of those six, only one of any size will get developed this year, and that's the Salamanca project in Spain. The rest will probably take 10 years to, before they get the infrastructure for development, like in Canada. So strategically, this is a very, very interesting asset to meet this growing demand. Um, the third leg of value is this belief that the project's going to grow from where it is. Um, Zona 7, which I mentioned before, was discovered just 14 months ago from some reconnaissance drilling. 
it was hiding under a bit of cover and had no radiometric signal. And it's completely changed our geologists' thinking around the genesis or the, the origin of these ore bodies. Zona 7 is a new discovery, and we've gone and mapped the region for areas that have a similar signature to Zona 7. And we've identified 11 high priority targets. And we've started drilling. We announced a couple of weeks ago that we started drilling, and we'll be releasing those results into the market in the coming months. That's just a bit more detail on, on the drilling program. Barclay Energy is listed on the London Stock Exchange, on the AIM market, and on the Australian Securities Exchange with the ticker BKY. We've got some phenomenal shareholders on our register, including BlackRock, um, Anglo-Pacific, River and Mercantile. We've got the largest private equity fund in the mining space, resource capital funds. And the register has been improving month by month. Since the new managing director, Paul Atherley, joined in July last year, we've got a lot of interest from the analyst community. Um, coverage has tripled, and most of those price targets are around the one pound mark. Uh, that's, that's really it. We've, we've been rated by Dave Talbot, who's uh, Canada's leading mining uranium analyst, as his number one pick for 2016, and Argonal considers us the best development project globally. Um, we're very excited about the year ahead, uh, and I'd welcome any questions if you have any. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah, so we'll open it up to questions there. So has anybody got a question for Hugo? Question just at the back there. I've got a couple of uh, questions, really. Um, to what extent will you expect any state aid from Europe, being as this is a, a European supply, um, which may well finance European power stations? Um, so that's the first question. And what sort of Spanish environmental problems uh, can you expect in terms of extraction and export of the product? And the third one is, Sona 7 was there, um, sat there waiting to be discovered. How can you tell there isn't a massive supply somewhere else equally waiting to be discovered with no signature? Yep. Maybe just answering sort of backwards. The, the, so the hope is that there is another Zona 7 um, because we've pegged all the ground in the region. So we, we are by far the biggest landowner. There, there actually isn't any competition in the region for deposits. And so we are by far the biggest landowner, but we're also spending the money and actually drilling. So the hope is we do discover another deposit. Um, and we've done, we've mapped the area, we've flown geophysics, and we've got a good understanding of the potential based on those. And so those, I think those drilling programs will reveal something. And the hope is it reveals something even better and bigger than Zona 7. Um, second question, environmental concerns. Uh, we've been through the process. It's, it's taken, you know, Barclay's been operating in Spain for almost a decade, uh, well, for exactly a decade by June, in fact. And getting a new uranium mine, or in fact, any mine in Europe permitted is a challenge. Um, and we've been through that and been successful. It's involved a lot of community consultation processes. We've done equator principles, environmental impact studies. And effectively, you are mitigating risks throughout that process and engaging with the government and the communities to mitigate risks and build your project accordingly. So we've been through that process and it's been successful. Um, in terms of the transport of uranium, that'll be done by a company that is registered to transport uranium. Um, Spain has seven nuclear reactors in operation, so there's currently a transport route throughout the country. Santander port is capable of transporting uranium, so that's, that's covered. I'm sorry, your first question was? EU aid. EU aid is available. It's, um, it's difficult to get. It takes a long time. And um, our view is that we are going gangbusters to get this built, and we'll, and we'll do it without EU aid. Uh, there are benefits for the project. Um, the, the tax regime is very, very favorable in Spain. For example, in a year where you generate income tax, you can put that taxable amount into a reserve. And provided you spend an equivalent amount of that taxable cost on drilling, environmental rehabilitation, or the acquisition of new mines, you offset that tax cost. So effectively, you know, if, if we are acquisitive and if we repair the environment and if we want to drill and explore, we'll pay very, very little income tax. Of course, there are, there are taxes like VAT and, and other taxes and land taxes that we'll have to pay. But Correct, correct. But, but it, it's a very favorable environment. And, and the fact that we need so little capital, I mean, relative to other mines, an $81 million capital raise is not a big, is not a big ask. And I think we can do that mostly from our existing shareholders. Thanks. 
Any other questions for Hugo? I just had a couple of questions. So in terms of the project, why has nobody else kind of targeted it before? Was it before Zona 7? Was it not considered to be of the same potential? Or? Uh, Zona 7 has, has changed from being a decent project to a phenomenal project. Sure. Um, the, the mine life as a result of Zona 7 has increased from 11 years to 18 years, and the operating cost has dropped from about $26 per pound to 15 So it's almost halved it. So Zona 7 really was the transformational discovery. Sure. And in terms of the funding of the company, I mean, obviously you mentioned the cost of bringing the mine into operation, mm -hmm. but how far are you funded through the process and, and kind of what's the plan there? We have $7.2 <coughs> million in, in cash in the bank, mm. um, which finances us well through to the development. The development financing, this is public information, we have a data room open and that financing process is well underway. Uh, we've got some great interest from all the people we want to be talking to are, are in the data room talking to us, and so that process is ongoing, and, and we're hoping full construction of the mine is in September, Sure. and we want to have the finance bedded away before then. And is there a certain amount of equity that you want to kind of maintain in the project, or is it? Um, we, we're open to different structures at the moment. Sure. Uh, we, are, we are open to selling an interest in the project, a minority interest in the project, yeah. certainly not a majority interest. So we'd do something potentially at the project level and at the top code level. Excellent. Great. Um, unless there's any more questions to Hugo. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hugo. Thanks Thank for you. that.